however much energy goes in at the beginning comes out at the end. So you combine these two things and you do the following. Imagine for simplicity you have a Z particle just sitting there at rest. How much energy, energy does it have? It's all mass energy. It's E equals the mass of the Z particle times C squared. And we, we know enough about Z particles to know what that mass is. And when it decays into a muon and anti-muon, each of those muons carries off exactly half the energy. But it's all in motion energy, which we measure using those detectors. So it's a very simple thing. We take the, two, we take the detectors, we measure the energies of the muons, we add them up. Is it equal to the mass of the Z particle times C squared? Yes, it's a Z. No, it's not a Z. It's that simple. It's almost that simple. If, it was, if the Z is moving, it's a little more complicated, but this is basically algebra, okay? This is not the hard part of doing quantum field theory, I assure you. <laughs> All right. Now, this is maybe a good moment to stop and, and take stock of what I've told you, because I've really told you how Hadron Collider physics works, start to finish. You take protons, you get them to collide with each other, and you get those mini collisions where, proton, where, sorry, where quarks and antiquarks or gluons and gluons collide with each other. And it's those mini collisions which do something interesting. They can be used to make something new, to make the universe ring in a new, in a new note, like a Z particle, which then typically falls apart right away into particles that we know about that live longer. And then those particles are actually measured in those detectors and use their properties or their energies and their directions of motion are used to infer what happened deep inside that proton pair right deep inside that proton-proton collision, what actually took place. And it's really pretty amazing that you can do this, but as you saw from the data I showed you earlier, it works. It really works. Okay, well I've told you about the Z particle, now we are ready to find the Higgs. Are you ready? Okay. All right, now what is true for the Z particle is also true for the Higgs. Basically the same idea. Remember that we made Z particles by colliding up quarks and up antiquarks and then the Z falls apart into a muon and anti-muon. And we're going to do the same thing, almost, for the Higgs. The Higgs can be produced by colliding two gluons together and if the Higgs is kind of lightweight, it may just fall apart into two particles of light, two photons. Or if it's a little heavier, um, it might first fall apart into two Z particles and then the Z particles themselves decay, and you end up with two muons and two anti-muons, for example. <coughs> now, this is a little hard to see, but it's pretty cool. Because in the CMS detector, on September 24th of this year, an event was seen of this form. It has two muons and two anti-muons, and you can even check that each pair comes from a Z. So, is that a Higgs boson? I don't know. Maybe. Um, probably not, because Higgs particles are rare, and there are other ways to make two Z particles. You can just make them directly. So I can't tell you by looking at one collision that looks like that whether it's a Higgs particle or not. So how are we going to figure it out? Well, we'd like to bring in the same team that was so successful for the Z particle and set them to work. And they would be able to do that except there's one problem, which is that we don't know the Higgs particle mass yet. So we can't play exactly the same trick, but we can play a similar trick. It's just that one collision is not enough. We need to see many collisions like that. So let me explain how that's going to work. Now what I'm showing you here is simulated data. We don't have this data yet, but this is what it's going to look like. The trick is, <laughs> well I should say, I, I, okay. this is, <laughs> let me say it better. This is the type of thing that we may see. <laughs> and in fact, part of the fun is we don't actually know exactly how the Higgs particle decays. We don't know what it decays to. It may decay in this way or that way. We've got to cover all these different possibilities. But one of the things people are going to do is the following. They're going to take all of the collisions that look like the one I showed you, two muons, two anti-muons, and they're going to add the energies up just the way we did before for the Z, and they're going to take those energies and they're going to plot them in a graph where if you add up the energies and it corresponds to a Higgs particle, a putative Higgs particle of mass 170 whatevers, they'll put it on this plot here at 170. And if they make that plot and it looks like this, just sort of random, that tells them that mostly what they're seeing is that other process where you just make two 
where you just make two muons and two antimuons directly without ever making a Higgs particle along the way. But if instead they see, in addition to that random stuff, they see a big peak in the middle. Okay. So basically what that would be telling them is that of all the events they have, there's some significant fraction of them that all have the same energy. And that energy is certainly the mass of a new particle, probably the Higgs particle. Okay? That's the basic principle. You look for a peak over what is otherwise random. And that tells you, first of all, what the Higgs mass, would, what the Higgs mass is. And it tells you that the Higgs is decaying in this particular way. And it even tells you how often you're making it. Right? The height of the peak tells you something about that. OK, so that's progress. Now, this is something that might happen this year or next. Okay? This is really coming. Okay? Um, in fact, the Higgs will probably not be discovered quite the way I've described, because people will throw every technique they have. So it'll be discovered in some very sophisticated way, combining different techniques, with lots of different processes. OK, it'll be complicated. But the basic principles are not the, that different from the one I've shown you here. And the clincher will be a plot like this. If instead the Higgs is lighter and can decay to two photons and not to two Zs, then it will be a much more difficult process. It will take much longer, but the principle will be the same. We will be looking over a very large random background for a very tiny bump, which is the signal of a Higgs particle. And that will take at least two years. Maybe it will have to wait until the LHC is upgraded to, let's say, four or five years from now. So this is not a quick thing. And on top of that, if there's more than one Higgs particle, it could take longer still, because you may have many things to look for, and it may take a while. So this is a process which could take one year. It could take seven or eight years. And there's just no way to know. We, all we can do is run the experiment and find out. Now, now you know how to find the Higgs, but I want to remind you that's not the goal. Right? That's the first step. Because the goal is now to understand the Higgs field. And to do that, we will have to study this particle in great detail. We will have to make many of them and watch how they figure out all the different ways that they decay, figure out how often we make them and, and in which ways. All of that will have to be studied and it will take the decade and probably beyond. This is a machine that's going to be around for the long haul.